And if you've played our previous stuff, you know that mountain is not just a backdrop. You can walk all the way to the top of that mountain. Huh. You think I can actually climb that thing? If so, why would I want to? Is there something special up there? Probably not. Hi, I'm Ren with two N's, your favorite little boy in the whole wide world. And today, I came out into the open world to talk to you guys about open world games. Now, let's start climbing this bad boy, huh? Let's give her a do. At their best, open world games give us exciting experiences by allowing us to fully immerse ourselves in these great big virtual worlds and do whatever we want. Unfortunately though, truly great open world games like Breath of the Wild or GTA V have become all too rare in today's market. Nowadays, studios tend to fill the open world genre with bloat, giving players the illusion of a better value. I mean, they seem to have this quantity over quality design philosophy, and I gotta tell you, I'm sick of it. Speaking of sick, I should have packed a water. So, I'm dying. <coughs> I can still taste the wine on that bottle. Okay, so they make games like Mirror's Edge Catalyst far bigger than their predecessor so that it feels worthy of its $60 value. I mean, hell. They had to fill Ghost Rectum Wildlands with all kinds of meaningless, boring site activities just so you could have something to do. All right, well, looks like we made it all the way to the top, and uh, just as I suspected, nothing's up here. Typical. But hey, man, look at that view. Much better draw distance than Minecraft, am I right? I'm gonna say I'm a little disappointed. I really thought something would be up here. I had high hopes. What? What? Holy shit! Do you guys know what this is? This is the lighter of legends. They say that when it's combined with the cigarettes of sinfulness and the gloves of grabbing, that it creates the ultimate cigarette. We gotta go find it all. Okay, while I search for those items, I wanna talk to you guys about something that I think a lot of open world games get wrong. In an open world game, traversal has to be fun. In GTA V, the cars handled really nicely, very satisfying to drive, especially at high speeds. In Mafia 2, the cars were bouncy and heavy. They really nailed that feeling of controlling an old-timey vehicle. In uh, Sunset Overdrive back here, you could wall run, grind, dash, and bounce all over the damn place. Good traversal translates to fun gameplay in between core, core activities. Fun abilities that are easy to learn but hard to master lay a great foundation for a good traversal system, as evidenced by Infamous here, which lets you zip around on power lines and hover throughout the city. Or Spider-Man Web of Shadows with its web-swinging mechanic. And of course, Just Cause 3 and 4 with its parachute, grapple, and wingsuit. I mean, you get the picture. But unfortunately, it looks like the green screen's busted here, so we're gonna have to start getting creative. And speaking of creative, today's video is brought to you by Game Maker. Hello, well, my darling. Hey, are you my mom? I am your mom. Did you know that Game Maker is the fastest and friendliest cross platform game development technology? And that whether you already create games on your own or you're looking to start, Game Maker is the software for you. Isn't that pretty cool? What's even cooler is that a good number of games that were created by Game Maker like Undertale, Hyper Light Drifter, and several others saw a lot of success. So maybe you could too once you know what you're doing. Most game creation softwares are lacking tools, meaning you'll have to hop between multiple softwares to make your game. But with Game Maker, that's not the case. No siree. You'll be able to accomplish everything you need to within the Game Maker software. It's called All-in-One Feature. They have a drag and drop feature, which means you can drop a dragon anywhere on the screen with intuitive ease. Look at him go. If you don't know how to do something, Game Maker provides a wide range of both video and written tutorials to make sure you have all the resources you need to make your own game. You can also meet thousands of other game developing enthusiasts by joining Game Maker's forum, Discord, and Reddit. So if you're all out of ideas, you can swipe some ideas off of some other game developers to make your game that much better. Wow, what a cool thing to have and service is good. So 
uh, start your free trial today by clicking the link below. Now let's get back to the video. If the game is more vehicle focused, then the vehicles need to handle nicely and have some sort of consequence for crashing at a high speed. In GTA 5, you ragdoll out of the car. In Mafia 2, you flat out die. This gave the transportation a wonderful sense of risk reward. There's something inherently disappointing about Paul walkering into a tree at full speed only to have the car receive minor damage. No consequences for speeding means that you don't have to put too much thought into driving. Love you. So, if the traversal isn't any fun, then neither is a large chunk of that game. Take Ghost Rectum Wildlands, for example. This game had cars that handled so sluggishly and they're so imprecise, it made driving no fun at all. Luckily though, you could hop into a boring old helicopter and take to the sky rim. A game where literally all you do is just walk from A to B, and it uh, got pretty boring. So boring, in fact, that it made me want to fall asleep in dogs. A game where the cars controlled so weightless and they were so flighty that it made driving at high speeds feel pretty frustrating sometimes. It made me want to rage too. A game where you could literally be driving down a straightaway in your motorcycle and you'd spin out for no damn reason at all. Pissed me off so much that I saw red. Dead Redemption 2, a game where the horse handles realistically enough, but it's still just not all that satisfying to ride. And I find that to be the case with most video game steeds, actually, that they're just not all that fun to control. While there are a handful of Assassin's Creed games like Unity and the Ezio trilogy that had a bit of depth to the free running mechanic, in the newer Assassin's Creeds, you need to ride an Assassin's Steed because the maps are so large indeed making the game's iconic parkour mechanic a little bit redundant. Even then, some of the entries in this series like Syndicate just had you holding the right trigger to mindlessly free run everywhere, while also mindlessly grappling with a hook mechanic that was no different from a quick time event. Good traversal is an absolute must for an open world game. In a good linear game, the developer can control how the player is meant to feel. A big bombastic set piece is usually followed with a slower moment. Maybe it's an emotional scene that drives the story forward, or maybe you're just given a nice little area to explore. Doesn't really matter what the scenario is, all that really matters is that they give the player room to catch their breath before moving on to the next big moment. Even in the best open world games, the opposite is true. After completing a story mission, it's possible that you can go hours and sometimes even days before starting up the next story mission. It's all too easy to become distracted by miscellaneous activities, side quests, collectibles, and even environmental landmarks, like, uh, like that little house back there. Actually, you know what? I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna check that thing out. All those distractions can make it easy to completely forget about important plot points, big story beats, and character motivations. Whoa, look at that! The gloves of grabbing, they were in here all along. Hell yeah! Now when I find those cigarettes, I'll be smoking like a king, baby. But it gets worse. Maybe you can't focus on a cutscene because you're too busy thinking about the fact that you're only 1,000 florins away from upgrading your main outpost. Maybe a cutscene is kind of broken and background characters are freaking out a little bit. As does a crew. Hang in there, man. We're getting close. Or maybe you're still laughing about that fat chick you ran over on your way to start the cutscene. In a world where anything can happen, it's far too easy for the game to accidentally undermine its own heavy emotional moments. I couldn't shoot him, so I pulled the gun to the front tire and shot it out. I didn't know what I hoped was gonna happen. I only know they crashed, and that little girl died. I killed her. While some games do get this right, that sequence from Mafia 2 where the side characters drunkenly saying, return to me in the car, comes to mind. I find that most open world games fail when it comes to successfully telling a good story. It's far more difficult to create a tangible story that manages to elicit an emotion from the players due to the endless distractions which often take away from the main story and characters. Help me! Please! Please! Get over here! Over here! God! God help! 
inside here! Help! 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 Please! Developers know this, so they resort to what people would call a sort of tree-like story structure, where it's up to you to take out the main villain. But in order to do that, you gotta systematically take out his high-ranking officers and destroy a few special outposts before finally gaining access to kill the bad guy. They did this in Far Cry 5, Ghost Recon Wildlands, Just Cause 4, Crackdown, Mafia 3, and plenty of others. Now let's talk about Just Cause real quick, a game with a superbly written main character. Since we saw Rico last time, he's just a burnout, burnt out old agency agent slumming around South America looking for the next shot of tequila and a loose woman. Just Cause is a package deal of all these trends at their extreme. The point of Just Cause is to collect and explore. But in other games, it's about filling time instead of making fun. It's almost as though the developers missed the point. Typically, the first outpost you liberate isn't all too different from the last. Same goes for each tower or synchronization point you have to climb to reveal a big portion of the map. This list is endless with rifts from Saints Row 4, Fox Shrines in Tsushima, Fixer Contracts in Watch Dogs, and Nests in Days Gone. There comes a point where we're not playing because we're having fun with the game, but because we're hooked on that sweet buzz of reward and progression. Oftentimes, fun gameplay can be sacrificed at the expense of that dopamine hit. You look up from your TV and next thing you know, your day's gone. Sometimes, because of all the additional side activities, the gameplay can overstay its welcome. Case in point, Ghost of Tsushima, a really pleasant game by all accounts. The visuals were nice, the combat was fun, but only fun enough for about 15 to 20 hours of gameplay, not the 40 or so hours I spent playing it. Then there's Days Gone, a game which had average gunplay and mediocre stealth mechanics that were serviceable for about 8 hours of gameplay, was stretched into a seemingly never-ending 40-hour story. Now sure, you can skip a vast majority of these side activities if you really want to, but they are almost designed to be addicting. You feel as though you need to complete them in order to be playing the game correctly. Sometimes if you ignore them, you feel lazy. And then, the rewards they offer can be too good to pass up as you'll get upgrades to your character, better weaponry, new abilities, or a new fast travel spot. Now, fast travel is a real tricky mistress, a necessary evil of the open world genre. Developers know that walking through the same patch of woods over and over again, or having to traverse from one end of the Elder Scroll all the way to the other, would push people away from their game. But at the same time, the fact that you can consistently skip all the scenery makes the environment feel kinda redundant and neglected. In Watch Dogs 2, you could fast travel just about anywhere on the map right from the beginning of the game. What this did was de-incentivize exploration for me since it was so efficient. And that took a lot of life and immersion away from the city of San Francisco because I spent about as much time looking at the map and loading screens as I did traveling through the city. The fact that fast travel needs to exist can be an admission that the open world itself throws a wrench in the pacing for both story and gameplay. Now, uh, how about we fast travel on over to the IHOP real quick? I came to this restaurant because I hop from one topic to the next with the greatest of ease. And some of these games pad out their skill trees about as much as this place pads out its pancakes with worthless fluff. So take Wolfenstein Youngblood, for example, a game that for some reason had an open world hub. Here you needed to unlock skills like dual wielding weapons or picking up a mounted turret. Abilities that were innate to BJ in the previous games and should be innate to the characters in this game since they're wearing power armor. Mirror's Edge Catalyst wasn't much better as you had to unlock abilities like the skill roll, the coil, and the quick turn which, again, were innate abilities to Faith in the first game. There's something inherently unsatisfying about being disempowered as you move forward through a franchise. Ghost Rectum Wildlands had the worst, most insulting skill tree I've ever seen. You had to unlock the ability to have your military-trained teammates pull their trigger at the same time as you. It's clear to me that these studios are simply trying to pad out their progression systems so that it feels as though your character is meaningfully growing. Do we have it? 
There are very few open world games that have exceptional AI or even good AI. Usually the AI ranges from middling to bad. Enemies are essentially just practice dummies for the player to unleash their abilities onto. In Just Cause 4, you're practically a god. Enemies sit still and allow you to do whatever you please to them. In Far Cry 5, human foes shoot at you from afar, and sometimes they even rush toward you in a straight line. In most open world games, the enemies do very little to prevent you from killing them. Part of the problem here boils down to level design. When developers craft an area for a linear game, it's easier to program AI around that, because there's a finite number of objects to hide behind, flanking routes, and pathways that the AI can take. Whereas in open world games, generally speaking, the environments are too open, so enemies rarely plan out attacks or work together in an effort to take you out. There's also fundamental differences in the approach to AI in such broad sandboxes. At its simplest form, AI is based on reactions to the player decision making. If you throw a grenade, then the grunt will try to jump away from it. If you take cover, then the elite will try to flank you. If you run out of ammo, enemies will charge you. You get the picture. So, in an open world, when the player can approach a combat encounter from 20 different ways, with a multitude of abilities and mechanics, on a flat street, open plain, or rooftop, the AI just can't keep up. It's almost like the devs say, why bother? The lack of linear levels or curated environments means weaker artificial intelligence. Over time, the thin range of possible AI reactions becomes repetitive and boring. The sheer breadth of open world makes balance difficult in a broad range of ways. And you know what? I wouldn't mind heading down to the old broad range myself and hopping into some game's open world. When you encourage players to engage in a vast selection of side content, all with rewards, it's difficult to manage how much they choose and what they choose. So it's equally difficult to balance their power. Sometimes I find I'm far too overpowered when I jump back into the main quest, trivializing the combat and the tension. Sometimes you don't even need to do the side quests to become overpowered. If you get lucky, you can stumble onto a weapon that you never feel the need to unequip. So Far Cry 5 is a perfect example of poor balancing on a different end of the spectrum. Within the first 45 minutes of the game, I wandered off the beaten path only to find an LMG that was so powerful I had no reason to save up for another weapon or bother looking for something better on my travels. This made the game's currency feel meaningless as I didn't need to purchase anything. And it meant that I now had no incentive to explore the environments for something better. I was overpowered from the get-go. And yeah, using the one gun did get pretty boring, but if I swapped over to anything else, I felt very inefficient. Even though linearity is much more restricting, I'm always gonna prefer it over an open world because these experiences are curated. They were built from the ground up to be gone through in a particular order where every room was placed into the game with express purpose, like filling the player with fear or a sense of curiosity, maybe wonder, and sometimes even humor or anything the developers wanted to achieve. Do I have your attention, boy? You're about to see some wonderful... Fuck! To me, most of the time, open world games just feel so... messy. Which is really no surprise, because it's far harder to polish 30 to 50 hours of filler content than it is to polish an 8 hour campaign. Because of the sheer quantity of content an open world game needs to have, it's all too easy for development studios to spread themselves thin. Which is why we get so many bland side activities, rushed storylines, and undercooked mechanics. I would argue that when a curated experience is firing on all cylinders and everything comes together perfectly, it just can't be beat. Until you beat it, of course. Oh, hell yes! Yeah, baby, I knew these would show up at some point. Hell yeah. oh, looks like the kids here already smoked some of them. Uh, those rascals. Thank you for watching our video. Even though the video is over, your journey has only just begun. There is still much to tackle in the realm of Ren's reviews. 
Try unlocking special perks by becoming a patron. Bonus cosmetics can be earned for clicking the like button and subscribing. Go back and watch the Ren's Reviews backlog for more content. I'd like to personally thank Ren for allowing me, White Light, to co-write this video with him. All hail gamer subs, dear oh dear. Use code Ren's Reviews at checkout for 10% off. Then check out my channel. Okay, we got the Lighter of Legends here, the Gloves of Grabbing, and of course the Cigarettes of Sinfulness. So uh, let's give this let's give this old gal a smoke, eh, boys? <laughs> wow. Well, you know, that smokes just like any old cigarette I've ever had. And the only difference is. I just look slightly cooler doing it now. Typical. That was not worth the effort of having to get all this stuff, but uh, who gives a shit? I'll see you guys in the next one.